Welcome back everyone to what will probably end up being the last video of Earthrise. So let's go ahead and uh, continue our adventure here on Earthrise. It's time to uh, to begin, or to finish. It's time to begin finishing what we started. So uh, let's go ahead and why don't we start with repairing that damaged cable that we saw. And in order to do that I'm going to need to remember where that was. I think that was on, wasn't that on the lower level? I think it was on the lower level. So let's, let's go ahead and take the elevator down. And I think it was... Isn't that in the power plant? Yeah, I think that... Wait, was it in the engine room or the power plant? No, the engine room was where... Uh, where there was that big force field and you could see that tunnel in the background behind the force field. I'm pretty sure the power plant is where we want to go. Now let's check the lights again. And we're going to the southeast, so we will need to put on our helmet. All right, let's go ahead and speed up the game just for a sec. And let's, oh, let's carefully walk over that. All right. And I think uh, here, yeah, here I can take off my helmet. So, all right, let's go ahead and come back here. And where is that damaged section of cable? It is, there it is right there. So, as I mentioned in the last video, what we needed was that welding torch that we got. So, let's go ahead and uh, check the torch again. It, uh, the tanks are almost full, so we should have no problem. It has a built-in eye shield, so we should have everything we need now to repair the cable. If I can spell it. You can pin the cable back in place, yeah, I guess we need to specify what with. So repair the cable with the, um, can I just say with torch? All right, you fire up the welding torch. That looks sort of like you may have been doing something indecent against the wall. Well, you've scorched the insulation and charred the wall a bit, but the cable should safely carry current. All right. Yeah, that definitely looks... <laughs> Definitely looks different from what it uh, looked like before. I can't say it. I can't say it looks like an improvement, but I guess uh, that's just the scorch marks around the uh, around the area. Um, yeah, your your repair job is adequate. You scorch the walls and some of the insulation, but it should hold. Kind of reminds me of uh, that part in Papers, Please, where you get that award. Don't, uh, doesn't the, you know when that guy shows up in Papers, Please, he gives you an award for adequacy, I think, if I remember right. Actually, maybe it's, actually, I think the award that you get depends on how many citations you've gotten. Anyway, uh, all right, let's go ahead and come out of here and head out to the engine room. Whoops, I'll want to, once again, very carefully walk across this ladder. And I think that's the last time that we'll have to do so. I think we won't need to worry about that ladder ever again. So, let's see now. We want to go now to the uh, to the engine room, which is to the east, and uh, and of course the east is also depressurized. I'm going to have to put my helmet on again. Boy, I'm just taking the helmet on and off. Uh, becomes a little bit ridiculous. All right, there's that dead uh, dead glitten, or I think it was a glitten. All right, now let's go ahead and slow the game down to normal speed for a second. Uh, notice here, so if you look here just to the uh, where I'm standing here, see that one red light flashing? Remember before there were two red lights flashing, now this left thing here uh, is green and the one on the right is flashing red. So let's take a look at these screens again. The screen on the left reads engine power nominal. The screen on the right reads navigation systems failure. So the engine power has been restored. We uh, fixed up that cable and now the engines have power again. Now the only thing that we need to do is fix the navigation systems. Well, that's easy enough to do because the navigation system, if you will recall, was right in this room over here. This is the, uh, the navigation computer. And what did we need? We needed a... Um, basically a length of cable to put into this big, uh, I guess it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a circuit breaker box, except that instead of having circuit breakers or, you know, fuse cartridges, they actually have lengths of wire, like lengths of fusible wire, which will actually presumably burn up if, uh, if there is an overcurrent situation. So let's see if we can fix things up here by putting the cable in the box. 
Uh, the wire you have is insulated end to end. To replace the fusible link, you will need bare copper on both ends of the wire. So yeah, this is the wire that we have. I think, hold on, if we look at the wire cutters, yeah, you should be able to cut or strip just about any size wire with these. So can we just say strip the wire? Yeah, you brandish your wire cutters and carefully bear both ends of the wire. If you look at it now. Yeah, the wire is stripped and ready for use. I think that's all we had to do. I think we just had to strip the uh, the ends of the wire. Uh, so let's try it again. Uh, put wire in box. Okay, you bravely reach into the elect electrical box and replace the fusible link with your wire. A small spark makes you jump, but you get the job done. It's not exactly up to code, but it should work. All right, now we... Oh! And right away the computer starts working and the tape drive starts spinning the tape back and forth and the lights start blinking and the computer starts beeping. Wow, that was uh, that was pretty quick. I guess the computer didn't need any time to boot up or anything. Do we need to... Well, let's just take a look at the computer quickly. The computer is humming and beeping away happily. Can we use the computer or do anything with the computer? Why? Really? I said use computer and the game asks why. Why would you use a computer? Uh... And I think we're all set now. If you look at those screens there, uh, you can see they're both green now. There's no longer any uh, any red flashing there. So, yeah, engine power and navigation systems are both nominal. So that was it. Like I said in the last video, what you needed was the welding torch to fix that cable, which restores power to the engines, and then just that piece of wire, that big, uh, that nice thick wire, which can carry a lot of power, which you'll need to replace the fusible link in the... Uh, in that fuse box uh, in the room to the right. That's it. We're all ready now. I think we can. Uh, I think we can push this red button here. This. Uh, if you look at the button, this was the uh, yeah engine start button. So let's go ahead and this is the moment of truth, ladies and gentlemen. This could be the uh, this could be the deciding moment of the game. Let's go ahead and push the button. You press the large button. You feel a deep rumble as the massive engines begin to operate. Good job! Now that the asteroid's engines and navigation systems are working, all you need to do is get back home. Alright, there you go, and I can see a little animation in the tunnel there, which I guess is meant to indicate that the, uh, the engines are functional. Um, you know, it strikes me, I don't think I've ever really talked about the plot of this game. I mean, we've been through several episodes now of playing the game, but I don't think I ever really talked about what the, the story here is supposed to be. Um... The story is basically not something that the game itself tells you. It's something that you were supposed to get from the manual. I think if you poke around online, you can still find the manual for this game and kind of get an idea of what the story is. But to sum it up very briefly, it's a... Um, I think that the story basically is that this asteroid that we're on, Solus, the, uh, the asteroid with this base that we're in, uh, is headed on a collision course with planet Earth. And so, for some reason, I don't know why, but there's some sort of history backstory there, why they built engines into the asteroid. But because the engines were not functioning, they couldn't trigger the engines to push the asteroid out of the way. So basically, the asteroid has become kind of like a big spaceship. Not exactly a spaceship, obviously, but it, it has engines built into it that can change its trajectory and change its... Um, yeah, you know, the direction it's traveling in. And so they needed to do that to prevent it from colliding with Earth. And now we've just enabled that. So now we've fixed the engines, the engines are up and running. And from the command center on Earth, they should be able to commandeer those engines to prevent uh, an asteroid collision with Earth and the obvious uh, subsequent disaster that that would cause. So that's it. At this point, we've pretty much won the game. Um, and as the game said, all we have to do is get home, and that should be pretty straightforward. I think it says a lot about um, about the nature of gameplay uh, and how we play games and how we think about games that, um, you know, we, we enjoyed it. I, I certainly enjoyed this game without having to think about the plot very much. And I like I said, I didn't even really know. Even now, I'm not really sure exactly what the plot is. Like, there's a whole backstory, which you can pretty much ignore. Action games, of course, have done this for years. Action games and first-person shooters and things like that. I'm going to go ahead and put on my helmet and walk through this tunnel while I'm talking. Um, action games often have completely throwaway plots where, you know, nobody really cares what's happening or why. I mean, yeah, there's a plot in Doom. There's a plot in a lot of first-person shooters like that. But does anybody really care? Just like in an action movie, the plot is pretty much an excuse to... Uh, 
to just get in there and shoot things. And we often think that adventure games don't work the same way, but really, in a certain sense, in a in the truest sort of sense, adventure games do the same thing. They, what we've done here is we've solved a lot of puzzles. We've explored our environment. We've solved some inventory item-based puzzles. And we had fun doing it, or at least I had fun doing it. I hope that you folks had fun watching. And, you know, the story is kind of... The story is not always that important. Even to an adventure game like this, the story is often just sort of an excuse to uh, to have an environment and to explore that environment. And that's what I like doing. That's why I like adventure games. I like to explore different uh, different places and kind of see what's there and to kind of play with the things and see what happens when I interact in different ways with my environs. And the story is kind of... Uh, well, a good story helps. Of course, it's good to have a good story. I'm not going to say that uh, the story is not important because it, it is great to have a great story. But uh, a game is a game, and it is something interactive, and the story is often secondary to the uh, to the gameplay. All right, that's my little uh, opinion piece for now. So, um, yeah, right now, the, the game wasn't lying. Really, all we have to do right now is uh, go go back and we can just take our spaceship back before we do that though let me just very quickly um try to find that communication panel i think no it's not here that's just uh i know this went to the mine but i thought there was a um maybe it's on the upper level there there was a room here in the asteroid where we can use a uh, communications panel to communicate with the base back on earth Okay, here we go. West is communication. So let's go ahead and come out this way. And I should have checked if I needed to put on my helmet here, but obviously I don't, which is good. And the room I'm thinking of is right here. So here we go. So if we look around here, there's a uh, yeah control console. So if we quickly look at the console, there's a standard radio transmitter here. So if we just say use transmitter, I know we did this before. Oh. Oh dear. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. For some reason I thought that uh that we were able to communicate with the guild after uh after doing that, but I guess not. Okay. Okay, well that's fine. So you'll want to make sure that you do this. Um uh, there are like I uh, like I showed in previous videos. There are two places in the game where you can communicate with your home base. One is on the ship when you first start the game, and then the other is here, uh, right here in this room. But of course, you want to do this before you cut those wires on the antenna tower, uh, because you get points for doing so. I mean, you don't have to do this in order to complete the game, but you will miss points if you don't do this. And of course, we want the points, right? Because uh, at least I I'm always very OCD about getting points. I always want to get all the points. I always want to get the maximum score whenever I play an adventure game like this. Maybe some of you folks don't care, and that's fine. I mean, you don't have to. It's not. It's obviously not compulsory. Maybe just having fun with the game is more important than trying to get the maximum score, but I'm just very... Uh, I'm just that way. All right, so here we are. We're out here on the planet's surface, and there is our ship right there. Let's go ahead and uh, get in and uh, return home. There is something green and very strange looking over your head. Uh, yes, I think it's called a spaceship. Wait a minute, it's moving! Uh, I think the fact that that message box is red is probably meant to communicate danger or something bad. Oh dear, uh, yeah, you feel like the Jolly Green Giant's Kleenex. <laughs> that's a, uh, that's not a mental image that I wanted to, uh, to be subjected to. Thanks, game. Well, whatever it is seems to be having trouble adjusting your pressure suit. Unfortunately, you can't move a muscle. You are held fast. The slimy thing just can't seem to digest you. Unfortunately, it isn't smart enough to give up. After several hours, you run out of air and suffocate. Too bad. You have asphyxi asphyxiated. Gosh. Well, if we didn't have our spacesuit, that thing would have probably digested us in much the same way as that uh, Timac, that blue blob at the bottom of the mine shaft. But um, this green slimy thing seems quite uh, quite persistent. It, it's not gonna. It it doesn't want to give up. Well, 
Those of you who have been following along the game from the beginning pretty much know what we need to do here. This is finally the place where we use that piece of cake that we picked up. Uh, yeah, it's actually the first item in my inventory here, but it's the last thing I use in the game pretty much. Uh, yeah, we read a long time ago in some lab report in the... Uh, in the science lab that uh, there was some kind of organism which is killed by the antioxidants in uh, in pastries so here we go this is basically the last the last puzzle in the game what we want to do is throw the cake at the slime nice shot he didn't throw it at the slime he threw it on the floor of the spaceship what kind of video are you throwing cake on the floor slime with a sweet tooth hmm Whoa. That cake must not have agreed with him. He barely made it 10 feet. Wow, I know people talk about cake being not healthy, but wow. Let's see, can we look at the slime now? It's a lifeless dried up puddle. Okay. Well, I think we can get into our ship safely now. Uh, can I sit down? Sit down and again, notice the control panel. So let's look at the panel. The controls have been locked on auto automatic by the guild. The only uh, usable controls you see are two buttons labeled automatic flight and automated return. So yeah, that certainly sounds familiar, yeah. So automated flight is what we use to come here, and now we push automated return to fly back to our ship. You press the automated return button. And I think it's basically the same flight sequence that we saw before, except in reverse now. How's that ship taking off without thrusters? I mean, I know the thrusters are firing periodically, but it started lifting off without the thrusters. I must have just missed it. All right, and here we go. The ship is, uh, I guess this is fully automatic. We don't have to do anything. We just sit here and watch the ship or the pod docking with our, uh, with our shuttle. I wish I had something clever and insightful to say here, but I really don't. This is uh, this is really it. This is the end of the game, and it's really just routine from here. We just walk out, we go, um, and yeah, we just do everything in reverse. We do everything that we did before, except in reverse order. So remember, we got our helmet from here. Let's go ahead and now put our helmet in the uh, what did the game call it? A cupboard. Uh, cabinet? What's the... Well, what does this panel over here call it? Yeah, cabinet. All right. Put helmet in cabinet. And we get points for doing so. And now can we push close cabinet? Yeah, to close that up just to be neat and tidy. And that uh, oxygen bottle that we got from here, let's also put the uh, bottle in the rack. You return the bottle to the rack. Excellent. And, um, like I said, yeah, here's the other place that you can use the transmitter. So you want to make sure that you do this, uh, I guess preferably when you start the game, just in case you forget. Uh, but you want to do this at some point in time because you will get points for doing so. I've, I've already done so. I already did so at the start of this Let's Play. Well, let's go ahead and just uh, lie down here and... Oh, wait, hold on. The communications panel is back here. Let's use the uh, panel and I can choose communications here. You briefly report your progress thus far and are told to return to Earth immediately. All right, we can do that. We can return to Earth. Well, actually, we can't return to Earth immediately, but we can initiate the process of returning to Earth. So now, those of you who uh, saw the first video might remember that I pushed automated return to return to Earth in, uh, in the first video with disastrous consequences, and the game basically took us down uh, a notch or possibly several notches but now that we're all done with our mission we've uh, enabled the engines on Solus and uh, saved the earth from the asteroid collision now we can push automated return you press the automated return button your shuttle will not go anywhere with the pod bay doors open so nothing happens okay actually I need to close the uh, okay push close pod bay doors you press the close pod bay door button you feel a slight tremble. Okay, now can we push automated return? You feel the thrust of your main engines as your shuttle breaks orbit and begins the trip back to Earth. All right, uh, I think that's it. The only thing left to do now is that other thing that I failed to do, or oh, I didn't fail to do it, but I kind of 
kind of embarrassed myself by doing in, uh, in a previous video because I couldn't figure out how to get out of this sleep pod. So I'm going to go into this uh, cryo unit and that is I think the very last action that you take in the game. Let me quickly check my oxygen level. Oh, I was, gonna, I was curious to see how much oxygen I ended up with. I know I filled up my tank once, but uh, actually I guess I can't check it now since obviously I returned my tank, so it says I have no tank. Well, that it doesn't matter. I, I probably still had plenty of oxygen, and if I started to run out, I think, I think you can refill your oxygen bottle uh, unlimited number of times. I think there's no limit to how many times you can refuel or refill your oxygen from that green tank in the um, uh, sleep pod area on board the uh, base on Solus. So anyway, uh, I guess this is it, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and lie down. And there we go. Look at that score. We got our, uh, we got the maximum score in the game. Great. Congratulations to us. A winner is us. All right. As you drift off to sleep, you think of the great task you just accomplished. You wonder what exciting mission the guild will send you on next time. And that does seem to be setting up the game for a sequel, but uh, as far as I know, there is not a sequel to this. All right, let's read the final report. Terran Mining Guild Archives, case number 294733, the Solus Incident. First class investigator returned to Earth after evaluating situation on Solus. Solus, Solus station secured. Second team immediately dispatched to Asteroid. Investigator's observations aided new team in dealing with indigenous life forms. Um, did our observations really help them in dealing with the indigenous life forms? I mean, all the information we got from that computer, so all the information was already known, it was already recorded in the computer, it's not like we really discovered anything. I mean, we knew from a lab report that, uh, that that slime was vulnerable to antioxidants in cakes and cookies and things like that, and, uh, all the other things like that, uh, that green three-legged thing was vulnerable to heat and I guess we figured out a few things like the fact that uh, that that Timac was vulnerable to ultraviolet light the computer didn't say that explicitly so I guess that was a useful observation since the Timac was responsible for eating those holes in the station that had caused those depressurized areas to appear so I guess that might have been useful to realize that they are vulnerable to ultraviolet light Maybe a couple of other things like that. Anyway, a uh, new team discovered six survivors from original team barricaded in living quarters. Survivors were malnourished, but had stored enough food to stay alive, barely. So I was right. Those locked doors in the residential areas where we got the uh, stuff like the comb and the, uh, the hammer and the gun and... Actually, a lot of that stuff we ended up not using. Now I think about it. I mean, we never used the comb at all, did we? There was no use... Unless I'm just forgetting it, but I don't think there was ever any use for the comb that we got from those uh, from those residential quarters. And the gun. We, we never used the gun at all. We never found ammunition for it. We never used it for anything. It was basically, in this game, it was completely useless. Uh, what else was there? And uh, there was the hacksaw. We did use the hacksaw and the hammer. Of course, we used the hammer to smash the glass on the um, garden dome. Uh, and the sock. There was that sock, that really dirty, smelly sock sitting on the floor. We never used that for anything. So a bunch of the stuff that we found there we never used. But anyway, so yeah, the uh, the doors that we couldn't open in that room did in fact have um, survivors who had uh, hidden themselves inside. But we never met them. This game is actually kind of... Uh, it's kind of a lonely game because you never see anyone for the whole game. You never see a single other person for the entire game. You just see those aliens that try to kill you. So it's a little bit uh, a little bit nightmarish in that sense, in the sense that you don't see a single other soul for the entire game. But anyway. All right, so we, uh, so we did it. We uh, helped in dealing with the indigenous life forms. We secured the station. And we, uh, and the uh, new team of investigators uh, rescued the survivors who were in the living quarters. And our final uh, conclusion is that the investigator, that's us of course, is to be promoted. End of summary. So we uh, of course are to receive a promotion for our nice work in handling the situation down on, uh, on Solus. Final score, 800 out of 800. Perfect score. Yeah, that's right. Sounds good to me. Thanks Earthrise for, uh, for giving us a perfect score. I guess that's a 10 out of 10. I guess that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Earthrise. Uh, 
I don't really have a lot to say. I think the game pretty much speaks speaks for itself. I think it's a pretty fun little game. I think it's a good, uh, a decent adventure. It's not for everyone. Uh, a lot of people do like character interaction in their adventures. A lot of people do think that dialogue, uh, you know, conversations or other sort of character interactions are very important. Uh, this game is none. Like I just said, you don't meet a single other character for the entire game. Um, the game does mostly revolve around inventory puzzles, which some people don't like. If you don't like that, then obviously this isn't really your type of adventure. Uh, and the, the environments are sort of monotonous. I mean, most of the game takes place inside an outer space space station. So most of the game has very drab sort of not very colorful graphics, mostly consisting of hallways and science, scientific sort of rooms in the space station. So if, if you like science fiction, that might be okay. If you don't like science fiction, again, this is probably not your type of adventure. I, I realize this game isn't for everyone, but uh, I do like it. And as, as I said at the beginning, it's obviously very much inspired by Space Quest, but it's not... Uh, it's it's not uh, just like a knockoff derivative. It's not just it's not a bad game that tries to be a Space Quest clone. It actually succeeds pretty well in capturing, I think, the atmosphere and the sort of uh, uh, dark humor of uh, of the Space Quest games. So I think this game was was a success. I think that uh, it's it's pretty well made. I mean, it's not the best game ever. It's not the most thrilling adventure that you've ever seen, but it's. Um, it's a good, solid little uh, little adventure game, considering when it came out, I think it's uh, pretty well made and does its, uh, does its job pretty well. So, thank you for watching, everyone. Thanks to the makers of Earthrise for helping us to enjoy this game even, uh, even now, something like, I guess, 24 years after it was released. And, uh, yeah, that's it for me. I'll go ahead and cut the video here and say, once again, as always, thank you for watching, everyone, and I will talk to you folks later. Bye-bye for now.